Ekka Pramata Chitsvatantriananda Vishrantaha Thank you. That is such a good question, um, especially when you look at the spiritual marketplace out there. There's a lot of options in terms of embarking on a spiritual journey. And for me, the realization what drew me to Tantra came many, many years later after a really pivotal event in my life. In my early teens, I had a near-death experience, and I've only started talking about it recently, as I had decades now to process that experience and make sense of it and reconnect with it and mind the transmission that happened during that near-death experience and i think nde near-death experience is it, just such a loaded term and actually nde should be called near-death transmission because there's so such profound lessons when that that happens and at one level it's traumatic and brings up fear of death and all of that but in my case actually it was it brought up the joy of being and what i mean by that is my experience was pure light of consciousness awareness of the pure light of consciousness there wasn't any form on the other side if you will and even the term on the other side is so wrong because i've only realized over the last several weeks that what happened is there wasn't a some wormhole that you go through to go to the other side of the universe where there's some deity shiva or jesus or whoever but was basically what happens was at least from my experience was folding back into your own self which is that same light of consciousness that I experienced in that near-death transmission. But that light is hidden, well obscured within me, in the center of my own being. And m a lot of people, when they experience a near-death transmission, there's people who have passed on or angels they see spiritual teachers on the other side so there's certain there's a certain form and how amazing that consciousness to to will create the environment that you need to make you feel safe to 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 teach you to teach you a lesson whether you're associated with the body and you need to see bodies and form on the other side in my case there was no form there wasn't a Shiva or Shakti divine couple, father or mother or anybody waiting for me. It was pure light of consciousness. And I wanted to stay there because I know, and it was the experience of that's our true home. And when um, it was a drowning experience and when they dove in and they took me out, I was so pissed off. I didn't want to come back. I was angry and sad at the same time. And I, I've, spend a lot of part of my practice processing that sadness and, and, and anger and overcoming any suicidal tendencies. <laughs> and, and I think, Benedict, what drew me decades later to Tantra wasn't something I read or anything. It was just the way I think about the spiritual tradition is a resonance. There's an energy, there's a living field of energy and awareness that naturally draws you in. And I've explored many paths over the years, whether it's uh, mystical Christianity, Buddhism, uh, Sufism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but the resonance of Tantra drew me in, and I didn't know it in the beginning. But as far as I'm concerned, any tradition, any practice, any teacher that talks about the light, the, that that light that has self-luminosity it's self-luminous doesn't depend on another light and it's only one light and that light is self-aware it has that vimarsha self-reflectivity out of which vimarsha shakti it creates within its own being that that whole amazing universe and this amazing planet that we live on and 
that light and therein lies the lesson i was brought back even though i was pissed off i didn't want to come back i was really upset at having to come back i was brought back number one because clearly have karma to burn <laughs> there's a lot of ego um like all of us planet earth is really spirituality 101 and number two to to serve because there was a there was a purpose behind that light and that light guided me one step at a time and it's a whole long story into into tantra and tantra that understanding of prakasha of that light of consciousness really resonated with with that that experience i had deeply deeply within me and through the practices of tantra that i truly embraced and and make the most important thing in my life that experience of the light within me while being alive while walking in this rotting body <laughs> has become more and more tangible and, and 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 real and understanding that i don't need to be suicidal <laughs> and wanting to shed the body to go home in as in permanent home in that light which is which birthed us and gave us life and sustaining life and out of its own freedom Svatantra Shakti, it created all of this and understanding and experiencing that I can abide in my own light that's already within me and really embrace the teachings of freedom and Svatantra Shakti and 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 live find that in myself and 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 live that in myself and and experience life as joy and begin to rise above the levels of mind the level of mind and all the karmic tendencies um whether it's anger sadness victimhood whatever it might be and burn that burn that in the presence of that light and discover that near-death transmission moment by moment while being in the body jivan mukti liberated while alive i don't need to wait until i'm dying to to be to be free and that's the power of of tantra it's elevating it's empowering it's telling you you can find it any any moment and what's interesting is if you do the math so let's say you you're practicing for 20 years tantra or any other practice and you have the number of breaths we breathe 21,600 breaths a day and then two-thirds of the time you're awake one-third you're asleep right and you can and, and this again is the elevating power of tantra for example the karma teaching of the nameless anakya within each movement whether it's thought sensation emotion or breath there's a pause and in that pause is exactly that near-death transmission i had it's that light as it's self it's self luminous and it's self-aware abiding reposing within itself and that experience is available in each pause of the breath between each thought between each emotion between each, in each sensation so if you equate one perception one phenomena arising in our awareness to one breath we have twenty-one thousand six hundred opportunities a day and if you take away this time we sleep and you say let's say we um we do a practice for 20 years you have 108 million opportunities over a period of 20 years to find your freedom and if you meditate for 40 years you'd have 216 million <laughs> right so and, and and in that sense time is grace yes time is decay of the body all of that and we move on but time is also grace because when you look at life as moment by moment opportunities for freedom and finding the joy and the light moment by moment life becomes amazing the beauty of tantric practices is that let's take for example the vinyana bhairava tantra where they give you 112 meditations you're given a menu of practices to appeal to the individual tendencies of each each person 
I might some people might not relate to breath practices. They might relate to a practice for where, for where they they find a place of peace and quiet just by listening to music, having an aesthetic experience that brings them to 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 a place of stillness and and freedom freedom within. Or it could be an energy practice, or it could be some sort of awareness practice. So we're given an incredibly detailed menu of practices, and in that sense, it can help everybody, even if somebody who's not necessarily a, a meditator. It's very interesting, Benedict, and we can talk about it later. I published my first book recently. It's called Sacred Repose, Abiding in Bliss and Freedom. And it's exploring, researching within the five schools of Tantra, the idea of stillness or repose. And one of my students in Belgium, she she does something very interesting. She 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 started reading the book, and she would write down some key sentences, some like really messages that resonated with with within her. And she sent me a list of 118 sentences, and I started reading, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is like becoming like Shiva Sutras, like Shiva Sutras of repose. And she does this healing modality where i don't i don't fully understand it but the person writes down freely without thinking and they're just letting stuff stuff out right so as i was talking to her i had this idea of well what if you take the idea of repose from tantra and have someone like a experienced practitioner psychologist or psychiatrist or whoever um with somatic experience who's open to both western and eastern ideas for healing uh people and helping people take the ideas of repose and make them practices uh and make them practical practical in terms of helping people uh in in in, in within the within the within the realm of repose and i think that's a very interesting area for someone i don't have the time to do it uh, and I'm not an expert in, in 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 healing and helping people in that way at psychological level, but I think there's something to be said about repose and and bringing that idea of stillness and and abiding in your own being uh, to help people uh, heal themselves. And it's very interesting because to switch topics a little bit, a recurring theme being a I have a very small meditation group. And I started teaching over the six years ago. Oftentimes, people tell me, Shambhu, thank you for class. I just had a great meditation. But can you please help me feel my body and body my body? I have a high stress job, something else is happening. I just, I have a body, but I'm not within the body. And that's what. And I realized that I need to start bringing in that sense of embodiment into, into my teaching. Um, I have a practice which I call connecting with the body. And during the sacred repose workshop, which people asked me to do, um, as, as more people became aware of the sacred repose book, I'm teaching what I call micro movement practice, where you begin to literally shake out any emotional and mental stuckness imprints from the body. In my experience and my view is that in the West, we unconsciously have become to use the body as a garbage dump. We cannot process emotions, get stuck in the body. Uh, we have an experience, we have mental impressions, and that's all, of course, connected with emotion, and that gets stuck in the body. And the body, over time, becomes garbage dump. I used to study acupressure, where you're using your fingers to open up meridians on, on, on people. And that's the same thing I saw, like a lot of, just a lot of stuckness. People can't even, they're not even open to someone touching them, right? And, and trying to help them and open a meridian using, using fingers. And... Yoga, of course, is important, Tai Chi, Qigong, which I do every day. But at the most basic level, and the practices in the Binyana Bhairava Tantra, one of them is which I teach is 
establishing awareness within the skin of the body and not living and and the body you you visualize and feel the body as spaciousness within the skin of the body and that practice is very grounding it's 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 it's, it's very freeing so that stuff that I ended up teaching because i realized okay i can teach people kundalini i can do a shakti transmission i can teach them sophisticated breath practices but that all goes to waste if it's not integrated in in the in the body we, this is a living temple this this physical body truly that's that shiva and shakti incarnate and it was very interesting last year i spent some time at the megaliths in my country of birth bulgaria and each megalith is truly a living being and this megalith it was very surprising because this one megalith which you could see it was a perfect cut you can see how the base was created it's massive megalith and how the megalith itself was symmetrical so it's clearly built by people but you're talking about tens of tons of ton i mean of weight i mean truly incredible and this one he had the energy of a sun it's really powerful fiery energy he was probably one of the central deities in that particular region in bulgaria just powerful energy and yet within that power as i was sitting there it transmitted a teaching to me it said softness of body softness of breath softness of awareness showing me okay shampoo you know your body is a little bit tight um too, too 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 hyper just relax not relax in the sense of like relax and tune out and relax and not be conscious but just soften your body soften your breath let the diaphragm fall into the body in, into the belly as you breathe in feel it with ease contracting back into the lower rib cage just feel the freedom of being within the body so this is a long long way of saying this there's so so many useful practices whether it's body awareness practices or just basic breath practices that everybody that everybody can use and um it would be amazing if more people even if who are not specifically drawn to tantra borrow those ideas and apply them in practice i think it's going to help a lot of people i love that question and it reminds me of the one of the reasons i got drawn to this tradition because in my view at least this tradition transcends time and space when i read the shiva sutras it just gets to the point chaitanya matna atma right consciousness is the self the self is consciousness second sutra agnanam uh, banda knowledge is bondage and it, it just gets to the to the issue and 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 the core teaching right away there isn't any creation story <laughs> there's no creation made there's no oh this um saint you know and that was his lineage and this and that there, there isn't much cultural there aren't many cultural trappings in this tradition to begin with so i don't think there's anything that needs to be done 10th century versus now because these are truly timeless timeless traditions if anything what needs to be done is unfortunately as you know this tradition thrived between the 8th and the 13th century before the muslim invasion in northern india and then it just got systematically destroyed over the centuries and it's truly a miracle and a testament to the timelessness and 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 and, and of this tradition that it survived and when you look at the way swami lakshmanju who i study closely because he was he had an unbelievably deep understanding and 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 way to transmit in a simple way that the teachings of the and the practices of this tradition i don't think he taught in a way that a different way that abhinava gupta would have taught thousand plus years ago uh there was there was no difference because again it's just free of all the cultural trappings that uh, you, you see in some 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 other traditions
Um, and there's like inherent freedom in that. And yes, occasionally when you read uh, tantric scripture, you would hear this all these sections about the having debates with the Buddhists or um, Sankyan, the people who practice Sankhya or whatever, right? And that was part of the spiritual milieu <laughs> back in the back in the day. And 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 that's fine. They they had to do this, and I tend to skip those sections. <laughs> Frankly, when I read scripture, I just try to get to the gist, what's practical. Um, but and, and sometimes, of course, they'll talk about their lineage and their masters and all of that. But uh, outside of these couple of occasions, it's it's pretty. They just get to the point. <laughs> uh, oh boy! So it, we have we live in very interesting times, where up has become down, left has become right, and we live in a world where emotion is viewed as a fact and as an opinion and and one of abhid of Agupta talks a lot about tarka and satarka mm -hmm. like reasoning right so i think he would just teach people basic logic <laughs> no i mean it, it's amazing you go to social media you, you go everywhere and i'm constantly blown away and i, I it, it, part of me is like i just can't believe this is happening in a way where emotion is becoming an opinion or fact and whatever area of life could be. And I think Avinav Gupta would be busy and he'll be traveling on, on you know, and he, you know, he'll become very rich having a private jet plane, traveling around the world and doing all these workshops on, let me teach you how to think. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and, and a lot of like that critical thinking, simple logic that as a society, it seems to me that we're, we're losing how can you understand anything if you believe that your emotion is a fact that your opinion is a fact and we begin to live in this you know facebook and google and all these people are talking about virtual reality and, and, and they're selling already virtual real estate and we're going to be wearing glasses and everything Abhinav Gupta would, would say probably, excuse my language, screw this shit, <laughs> right? Let's just like remember how to think, step one, and what feeling is about. That feeling is shocked in motion. L let, let's begin to understand that life is the interplay of consciousness and, 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 and energy. So I think if Abhinav Gupta was alive today, he'll be a very busy, busy man. <laughs> It kind of relates to the previous question, Benedict. We live in a really busy world. We live in a very materialistic world. And I, I so oftentimes think about and chant Sanskrit, even just chanting the Sanskrit alphabet, especially the vowels. It has a sacred resonance. And I love studying etymology a little bit and, and, and linguistics, which has become a topic of interest for me. And interesting enough, I'm Bulgarian and Bulgaria is number, the, number one in the world in linguistics. Um, and we're very good in math, traditionally. Um, and when you look at the history of languages and, and when you look at What makes a language an ancient language? And what makes a language an ancient language is when you break down a word, there's extra layers of meaning. And generally speaking, those layers of meaning embed spiritual secrets. And they're, they're in harmony with the universe. And when you look at the English language and Western languages in general, they have deviated from that. So I can show you a chart of Bulgarian, Hittite, Sanskrit, Latin, and then English, showing you that deviation of Western languages away from the ancient sacred languages, which embedded by the grace of our ancestors and, and the creator, that sacredness of, of the language. And the West has become to to deviate from that the language itself 
is far, far, far away removed from that sacredness. And language itself has become an instrument for enforcing duality and materialism. And that's why I'm so drawn to uh, learning Sanskrit, rediscovering my own language of Bulgarian language. And the more, the further back in time you go, the freer you become in the modern world that is going crazy it's hectic that's artificially produced stress the american dream of buying the house with a white picket fence and the well-dressed family that goes to church on every sunday and the dog um and the big mortgage <laughs> right so you get you get sucked into that and you that you know and some people talk about you know the matrix and being a slave to the system and that's a very real experience we get inundated with the pressures of everyday everyday life and technology and now artificial intelligence etc cetera, etc cetera. and the modern tantrika has to rise above that and and discover the teaching of the light of the one light of one consciousness of one shakti that becomes many shaktis we didn't know of that and that's very challenging and that's one of the reasons i wrote the book on the repose and one way you can do that by truly embracing the teachings of repose in that modern madness of that increasing cycle of materialism to find those moments and seek those moments of stillness and repose over and over again and dropped in your own sense of being while the world is doing whatever the world is doing <laughs> and find peace and freedom in all of that so in a way that intensity of modern life causes us to go go within deeper uh not just to survive the intensity of modern life but also to make sense of it and within that intensity in whatever the condition is to find freedom so in a way that's a really powerful teacher stress-filled world materialistic field world can be a very powerful teacher I can only speak from personal experience. And in my case, yes, and I still have a guru. And I'll keep on having a guru until there's no ego left. Because whether the guru is your partner or, or a friend or, or, or an actual teacher or life itself, I think each of us needs a, needs a, needs a teacher. And there's a, a lot of people talk about Oh, I don't need a teacher. I'm doing the pathless path or whatever, whatever idea they might have in their mind. And from what I've seen so far, I don't see any real progress or ego destruction, steady ego destruction until there's no ego left and th there's no separation left. And having said all of that, at the same time, there's something to be said about the inner guru. I, I moved to Kauai about six years ago, and I had to because being in the Bay Area on the mainland for for many years and in a high stress environment, a lot of people. Um, I needed to be around the ocean um, and in the loving embrace of Mother Kauai to 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 for the island to help me to begin to slow down and in 2020 i was on the beach and this voice told me to start spending one hour a day in stillness he did not tell me to meditate in stillness but just to stay in stillness and do nothing uh, allow yourself to be to be worked and i could have said oh it's just my mind talking whatever and 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 from my experience when the mind is talking and trying to trick you it might be in a very subtle way, it even might come in as a highly elevated spiritual message. 
but it's still the mind, there will be an emotional or mental overtone around that message. In that particular message, there was no emotional or mental overtone. There was, it wasn't even like a, a, a command. You shall meditate or you should be in stillness for one hour. There was none of that. It was very open and spacious. Hey, you know, you should, you know, spend an hour then in stillness. And I was like, okay, ma'am. And I started doing that. And you start doing that, the fruit of that practice is, I should say that 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 investment, you begin you begin to hear. And it was this, that same voice uh, a couple of years later that told me to go to Bulgaria, and, and because that's where the message was, that's where it all started. And it turns out that Bulgaria has amazing ancient spiritual history, amazing yeah. primal temples from the creator himself herself the womb caves in bulgaria the megaliths in bulgaria and and i've discovered over the last couple of summers there are hundreds of womb caves where you go and your heart just breaks open just by being in those places and ego just drops <laughs> just becomes nothing and you spend time at the megaliths which are like cosmic antennas and your spine starts vibrating and your chakra start opening just by being there you don't do anything and that same voice that told me a year later to write a book on repose. And you begin to hear the more time you spend in stillness. And Benedict, I, I, I see that so much often with, and I went through this for more than 10 years in my own practice. I was so busy doing the meditation technique perfectly doing the breath perfectly counting the breath this pranayama that pranayama moving the kundalini up and down this way that way and it, it just becomes a spiritual circus <laughs> so fine you can manipulate energy and you become like a spiritual circus juggler <laughs> of shakti or breath or this or that but there's no expansion in consciousness and truly those practices are not invalid they're they're valid but you do these practices, whatever practice it is, until a point where it brings you to a stillness and a presence of being where you can marinate and allow the inner guru to, to teach you, to show you, as opposed to you trying to elicit and force a result. Okay, if I move the Kundalini this way and that way, I'm just gonna be so powerful and I'm gonna feel groovy or or whatever, right? It's it's still you're still bound by ego. And only by reposing and stillness, based on my experience, you begin to free yourself from that. And 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 it's actually your experience, based on my experience, that the spiritual practice itself can become the obstacle. The spiritual practice itself can 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 keep on reinforcing duality and your ego. And only in stillness and repose, you can begin to see all your crap, all your egoity. Let me give an example. So with my meditation group, every three months, we spend three hours in un uninterrupted stillness each day for four days in a row. Every Saturday, we do it for two hours. And I, you know, we try and I tell people I try to do it one hour a day. During the last stillness retreat, on, on the last day of three hours of uninterrupted stillness, I had this experience in my solar plexus. I, I, I was in perfect stillness doing nothing and allowing whatever I need to experience and be free of or made aware of to emerge from much higher intelligence without me forcing anything. And I had this image in my solar plexus of two people arguing when I was a little baby, just barely a couple of days out of the womb. And those people, as far as I could figure out, were my parents. They were just arguing, but in a very vicious kind of like way, right? And that created an imprint in me that really reinforced fight and flight syndrome. And surprise, surprise, I love to pick up a good fight with, with whoever, right? With work, with my partner, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and just seeing that and having compassion for myself that that imprint happened to me from outside, and I at a very immature age where I wasn't, I couldn't process it. And of course, that's a karmic thing that needed to happen to me. 
but be, that being exposed and crying for half an hour and just letting letting it out that it's purifying so getting purified you being drawn deeper into the black uh tar pit of karma <laughs> and what was amazing 30 minutes later after crying my heart out and my eyes out i experienced myself as pure potentiality the base of the spine to the crown the chitrini nadi i experienced myself as the very first body i was given by shiva and shakti as pure potentiality before i started using my will to create karma so you experience you're going deeper into the karmic pit the blackness of the karmic pit but at the same time you're going higher swami lakshmanju would describe this and i just love this so much you're rising up and you're rising down you're rising down because you're being purified you're not going down in some sort of a hell or a sin you you're rising down into the karmic pit because you're getting purified and because of that you rise higher and that's my particular experience and the only reason i'm sharing it is not to demonstrate that i'm some sort of highly evolved being or whatever but to show the power of stillness as the guru whether you have a physical guru whether you have a guru who's passed from the physical frame and is watching over you from the light or whether you don't have a guru ultimately stillness the light itself is is the guru and if you haven't if you happen to have a physical guru and maybe you had another guru who's not in the physical form and and at the same time you you, you know use stillness as the guru even better the more the more gurus the better the more mothers so fathers the better as far as i'm concerned i think it's important to study scripture and and luckily there there's more scripture made available and being translated uh that's the good news the bad news is it's can be difficult to digest um in my case when i started reading scripture uh, the shiva sutras tantra loka whatever was available from tantra loka before mark jikovsky thank you mark for having um spending decades and bringing to us bringing to light the full translation of tantra loka It, 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 it was difficult so I, I think it's important in that context to, to to have a to have a to have a to have a teacher who can take a, a scripture and and make it make make it real to your point earlier make it real in 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 in, in this life how can i take this tantric concept or tantric practice and and make it make it real in in, in daily, daily life and going back a little bit to the previous question Benedict if you my advice would be if you want to understand and study Tantra study Swami Lakshmanju study Lakshmanju's work because he was the like direct the last direct descendant of the Shaivite masters from the 8th 13th century his lineage goes all the way back and the advice he gives on tantra is is, is 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 so powerful he says one of the things he says is he emphasizes his yoga in action just simple breath awareness during the day makes you sit in meditation so so much more powerful and the other things he talks about is innocence bringing a sense of innocence in your practice start your day like a child breathing for the first time in my case my breath awareness breath awareness i embrace breath awareness as taught by swami lashmanju four years ago simple anchor practice that's always available because we breathe all the time it's completely changed everything for me so there's something to be said about simplicity and doing one thing over and over again it creates a groove in your being and with breath awareness i can i it exposes my karma it exposes my tendencies it's purifying and at the same time elevating and when i bring that sense of innocence childlike innocence 
I don't remember it every day. <laughs> I just start, okay, I'm just going to be aware of my breath. But when I have that, when, when I wake up and start breathing as, as if, as, as, if a as, as a child coming from the womb and taking the first breath, ah, oh, wonder of wonders. I, can, I have a body and I can breathe. It, it just takes you practice to a whole, to a whole different level. And then he also teaches the Shambhavi Mudra, where with eyes open, you, you stabilize yourself between the internal and the external world. And, and these are powerful, you might call them secrets, but you just need a, a, a teacher to, to help you with these things. So highly recommend studying Lashmuju. And of course, the wonderful books about Tantra. I think uh, Chris Wallace has done wonderful work combining scripture and practical applications uh my book i the feedback i've heard about my book sacred repose uh and that's what i've done grounding the scripture i try to extract the okay this is the teaching this is the practice implied and sometimes practice is, is implied it's not explicitly given from scripture let's explore that why don't we do this and it's incredibly it's incredibly powerful let me give you one example um one of the teachings in in Tantra Loka and Tantra Sara by Abhinav Gupta is about objectivity. First, it being established in your own being, you extend your awareness into an object. You feel, you infuse that object with your awareness, and then you bring it back in, in your awareness. Breaking down that barrier between subject and object means annoying. And I'm doing a workshop on Sacred Repose 12 weeks every Saturday. And this last Saturday was session number four. And that session was on objectivity. And I recorded that practice uh, preparing for the workshop a few weeks ago, but I haven't been really doing it, to be frankly honest. And then as part of the workshop on Saturday, we did that practice, another one. And the fruit of that practice was I experienced so much sense of happiness and elation and lightness by doing this practice. Because what happens is, okay, you can read the theory, right? You can read about subject, object means of knowledge. It becomes in intellectual knowledge, but you have to put it into practice. And, and when I put it into practice, just by using scripture, really following scripture very closely and just make it in a meditative practice, the base of my spine opened where we experienced objectivity. And I started experiencing these waves of bliss as my sense of being expands beyond me and into the objects around me and feeling this symphony of energy around me, right? So whether it's this crazy Bulgarian or uh, someone else, find a teacher that can take, you know, comp and, and some of the tantric scriptures like the Ishvara, what Pratyabhijna, whatever it is, some of those philosophic, philosophical treatises, you read them and you want to poke your eyes out. It's just a lot of philosophy. It's very dense, right? So you want to have that Lakshmanju-like guidance, right? Or, or whoever to dumb it down, if you will, Tantra for dummies, right? And and, and make it practical and, and, and have that begin to flourish in you. And over time, you begin to understand scripture better, um, the Shiva Sutras or whatever the, 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 the case might be. Absolutely. And I want to express heartfelt thanks and gratitude for all these tantric scholars and practitioners. Not all tantric scholars are practitioners to be clear. Um, and I'm lucky to have surrounded myself with several tantric scholars who are also practitioners. But not all tantric scholars are practitioners. And and that, that kind of shows, you know, they do some really deep work and translating new stuff. And some of the academic papers are, papers are truly, truly wonderful, right? Um, and you have this extreme spectrum of tantric scholar who's doing Tantra and translating Tantra, but actually they believe is Mamu Jumbo. <laughs> that this is just whatever, some, some something fake. To a real Tantric scholar slash practitioner, by real I mean that someone who 
leaves those teachings, right? So it's a it's it's a wide spectrum. So wherever on the spectrum that person is, they're doing tremendous service. So so thank you. Whether you're not a believer, tantric scholar, or a believer tantric scholar and a practitioner. And that revival is very is very real. And when I started, when I got the message from the goddess basically to write the book on repose, I realized I need help. My Sanskrit is rudimentary, and I reached out to Ben Williams, who I collaborated with on the book. And without him, I would have still had a book, but wouldn't have been as good, wouldn't have been precise and 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 and, and, and as close to the original meaning. And, and teachings of, 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 of these practices. For example, when I started doing the work on repose, Vishranti, meaning, meaning repose, I started looking at, at Vishranti only. And then I realized, as I, was, I would meditate on the book, and I, I, I would just get still and see what other messages I get. And then the messages I get is, OK, within that, discussion of repose and stillness, look into the bindu, the still point. Look into dynamic stillness. And then one day I bought Mark Zhikovsky has this big stack of books on the one of the Kubjika goddesses. I cannot even pronounce the name of the books. I bought it and I never opened it. I just got overwhelmed by, by the stack, by the, the box and I put it in the closet. And one day the same voice tells me, Shambu, it's time to open up that box. I open up the box and I pick up, uh, I think it was like the first or maybe the second volume. And then it was really incredible. I open up the page. I open the book on a random page. And I'm just like reading. I start reading. And within a couple of sentences, it says, Nirachara Yogena, the yoga of stillness. <laughs> well, that became a chapter in the book. And it was Ben as we started working on the book and he started like realizing what I was after and, and connecting the dots and putting this bigger picture of, of stillness practices within the broader tradition. He one day he sends me an email, oh Shambu, you should look at the uh, Anakya. And here's a quote from John Namek from his book Ubiquitous Shiva, where he specifically makes correlation between Vishranti repose and Anakya, the nameless state in, within the Krama tradition. Well, guess what? I had to write a, a chapter on Krama, right? I had to learn Krama and, and look at the practices on Krama, which are really sophisticated. It's a very difficult tradition to understand. So in myself, I had to spend time a lot of reading and meditating and extracting the key messages, the, the key practical applications of, of the Krama tradition. So this is an example of where you have a guy like me who has rudimentary Sanskrit knowledge, who does read scripture, but he's not a full-time scholar collaborating with a scholar practitioner who's willing to collaborate with a schmuck like me, right? So credit to Ben for doing this. So I think hopefully Ben and I uh, uh, set a precedent. <laughs> trailblazing a precedent where more Sanskrit scholars can collaborate with practitioners and come together and, and, and have this synergy where they just bigger knowing, bigger that fire of knowledge becomes bigger by having this by having this interaction, right? So I think the next stage of evolution of these teachings would be more collaboration like this, or the tantric scores like practitioner rather than just writing academic articles and being so stuck, if you will, contained within the academic Sanskrit community, which has its own code of conduct and expectations and all of that. That's fine. Don't leave that. But maybe on the side if you will start your own website and say okay and start sharing with people whether it's on facebook or instagram or on your web website website youtube channel whatever the case might be hey look i've been studying this i've wrote these articles 
and I'm living this tradition and 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 these are the practices that have been helpful to me and let me share that with you right without jeopardizing your standing within the academic Sanskritist community but you're beginning to sh to share the the fruit of the of, of those teachings of those practices right so that will be my encouragement to those um Sanskrit is less practitioners don't, to not stay in the closet, right? But begin to get out there and help people. What is at stake with Tantra revival? It's really about unleashing the power of the freedom in hearing those teachings in the modern world this become increasingly more materialistic the, the point I, I i made earlier and really teaching people that we are shiva Kind of goes back to the, the earlier question, uh, Benedict, a little bit. One of the things I've done is I had this idea of extracting a few key messages from Tantra, from scripture, particular verses that have particular resonance uh, at the sonic mantric level. And I'm working with an artist called Christine Hoffman, who's not a Sanskritist. So uh, Ben has had to help her a little bit with the pronunciation and it's it's not perfect but I, i've been working with her to and she would meditate on a particular verse and then she would sing it she's an amazing artist she, she writes the music she writes her own lyrics in general but in this case i'm giving her the tantric lyrics the sanskrit lyrics and hopefully by the end of this summer 2024 we'll launch the album we have six mantric um chants extracted from scripture and one of them is a verse from the Kular Nava Tantra, 942. Just don't don't ask me how I found it. <laughs> I forget. Um, but the verse goes something like Jiva Shiva Shiva Jiva Sajiva Kevala Shiva Pasha Baddha Smrito Jiva Pasha Mukta Shiva Jiva And the meaning of these verse is Jiva Shiva, Jiva the individual. Jiv in Bulgarian means alive. Another <laughs> correspondence between Sanskrit and Bulgarian. Shiva is the individual, the individual is Shiva. The only difference is just separation, limitation, right? And that's the realization that, and that's the limitation that Shiva imposed on himself as part of the play of consciousness. And I think that's a stake. It's, it's that realization that you are Shiva incarnate. And, and, and how beautiful. And having that realization and direct experience in an abiding and sustained way while being in the body, enabled by this tradition that gives you a path of effort, embodied path, path of energy, path of awareness, and no path. You're given the whole, the whole, the whole menu. W what bigger stake than finding your freedom, knowing that you're Shiva? And again, you get into. Uh, it's frustrating because language is so limited. When I had my near-death transmission, there was no Shiva or Shakti waiting for me. There was no Shiva and Parvati or Brahma or whoever, or Jesus or a Sufi master or whoever. It was just the light of consciousness. My humble advice is everybody who's interested in this tradition, start with the Shiva Sutras. I, I talked about, about them a little bit earlier, they're timeless, they're similar to Zen koans. 
in that there's a message and you can't intellectualize it, you can't understand it. And you can just sing the verse itself as a mantra. Don't worry about what it means. Just, just sing it. Just, just sit with it and let that knowledge embedded in the mantra and supposedly that came from was direct transmission from Shiva to Vasugupta and there's the rock in Kashmir where that that happened similar to the stone tablets in the Bible right the, the rock magically turned and or it was a dream that it, all the sutras appeared to Vasugupta and whatever the legend is there's so much reality and and empower them and and what I love about them is that and they're what called three awakenings in the Shiva Sutras. You start with from the awakening from the basis of awareness, consciousness. And you read the first sutra, Shiva Sutra 1 1, Chaitanya Matma, consciousness is the self. And you meditate on it. Don't don't read the commentary yet. You just hear it. You hear the mantric resonance. You meditate on the mantric resonance first. Then you can meditate on the English meaning. And then you read the commentary. And just by reading that, you can be free. Just by reading one sutra. They they always start with the highest. And then, okay, you know, I've I've done these three steps and I don't still get it. And, and they keep on reading. Right. And then you move into the path of energy and then the path of effort. So you start from the highest. And if you don't understand it, and if you end up going all the way back to the Shiva Sutras, all the way to the last sutra it's it's all fine what's so powerful about tantra is that from the lowest practice i mentioned earlier meditating with an object and bringing that object within your field of awareness you realize you're not separate from that practice alone you can achieve what's called the great pervasion from the lowest practice you can go to the highest so it doesn't matter. It's it's so elevating. And actually, Swami Lakshman Jew explicitly says this. You elevate yourself. So uh, Shiva Sutras and, and Abhinava Gupta, who kind of synthesize the, the tradition, speaks highly of the Shiva Sutras, and that's kind of really the, the foundational, foundational text. And frankly, you can just study the Shiva Sutras all your life. If you truly want to go in depth, then this this other text, and I'm not even going to mention their names, the Tantra Loka, of course, we have a full translation available right now. For a beginner, for a newbie, it's just going to be difficult to digest. So start with the Shiva Sutras, look at the Swami Lakshmanju translation, look at the work that the Lakshmanju Academy group are doing. Uh, actually, right now I'm I'm taking they have a webinar, a weekly webinar on the Shiva Sutras. Chris Wallace did a workshop on the Shiva Sutras, look at the work he's doing. That for me is the most, most foundational uh, text. Then the other one will be the first five chapters of the Tantra Loka. After you master the Shiva Sutras, start moving on to the first five chapters of the Tantra Loka. Yes, I, I talk about the specific practices that I found really effective and that again, is the breath awareness practice from Swami Lakshmanju, who says, just watch your breath and pay particular attention to the pause in the breath. Uh, recently, um, we had Shiva Ratri, the night of Shiva, and there's a verse in a, in a scripture that describes Shiva Ratri as, so Shiva Ratri is, understood, is in the, in, understood as the union of Shiva and Shakti, the union of energy and consciousness. And the real practical application of that is realizing and feeling in every pause of the breath. Okay, I'm breathing in, I'm inhaling. And I become very aware, I'm really present with the pause at the end of the inhale. Where there's no inhalation, there's no exhalation. However, momentarily, they're not different. There's no breath. There's a moment of stillness. And there's no thought there. So in the pauses of the breath, you have cessation of inhalation, exhalation, and thought. And that, that particular verse comes from Utpo Deva's um, 
hymns to the praise of Shiva. I'm, I'm blanking on the Sanskrit name. That's how Shiva Ratri, the night of Shiva, that union of Shiva and Shakti is described in a practical way. So that's one simple practice we, that we can do with every breath during the day. The other one that I've embraced is, and Swami Lakshmanju, then you begin to incorporate the energy body within within the breath awareness and and the way he he practiced this on the inhale at the end of the inhale you you make in the contact with your eyebrow center so you begin to bring the energy body into the breath awareness practice and then in the exhale he would touch the lower vadashanta the lower end of 12 which would be 12 finger which below the bridge of the nose that's his own transmission of where the lower point of emission is that's the practice he would do and he also taught a variation where on the inhale you're touching your eyebrow and on the exhale you're touching your heart center in the middle of the chest that's the one i do because uh, i i have a my my teacher my guru the heart is the foundation of, of of my practice so i like to incorporate heart my heart and my awareness of my heart center within within awareness of the breath cycle right so these are the two practices that i do um that completely changed my life and then i mentioned body awareness just being in the body feel where your feet are and and just let your mind let your awareness be within the skin of the body and that's a particular practice in the vinyana bhairava so just doing these three practices alone you don't need anything else everything else is going to unfold from it and a couple of the practices i'm teaching in the workshop were really a maturation an unfoldment and actually i'm teaching that i've never seen them in scripture i'm teaching a a practice that by speeding up your awareness within the breath you achieve buddha-like state of awakeness you just wake up like this right and i haven't seen the scripture i haven't seen anybody doing this and I didn't make it up. It really came in as a maturation of just doing these three basic practices over and over and over again. And then you're going to get the inner gurus going back to the guru. You're going to get the message. You're going to get this whatever practice that you need to, to, to make you go deeper, um, you, you, you're going you, you're gonna to receive. So my, my advice is, Pick a simple anchor practice like breath awareness, being being in the body, and do it over and over and over again with depth over time, with childlike innocence every day, with one pointedness of awareness, and that's gonna change your life. The special quote I would love to share, in addition to the little mantra called Kularnava Tantra 942 that I um, shared earlier, is this is a quote from Tantra Sara. There's the center piece and the main message in my book, Sacred Repose. And uh, from the particular verse, uh, Ben Williams helped me extract just the mantric, mantric words. Eka Pramata, Chitsva Tantriananda, Vishantaha. Eka Pramata is the one knower. Eka means one, Pramata, there's only one knower. Chitva Tantriya Nanda Vishrantaha. Vishrantaha is the, is the verb, meaning reposing. That one knower is reposing. That's the nature of reality. There's only one knower. And that knower is reposing. W what is that knower reposing in? Chit, consciousness. Svatantriya, freedom. And another bliss. So there's only one knower reposing in consciousness, bliss, and freedom. The one thing I would add is, as sentient, self-aware human beings, we have the God-given capacity and birthright to find our realization in this lifetime. Not another lifetime, this lifetime, right here, right now. And by the grace of the tradition by the grace of the ancient masters we've been given many teachings and many tools to 
to accomplish this. We don't need to have a near-death transmission experience of the light of consciousness to find that light within us, that we are that light. May all beings discover that light, that they are that light. Eka Pramata Chitsvatantri Ananda Vishrantaha Eka Pramata Chitsvatantri Ananda Vishrantaha